Good evening and a warm welcome to everybody. I have the pleasure to moderate a conversation between three gentlemen who did not know one another in the age of connectivity and all three work on very much the same topic uh, and met here for the first time. So this is of course, I think, all the more exciting for a conversation that we're going to have about networking or nightmares of the internet and a platform capitalism or a surveillance capitalism that we're also going to talk about. So within a short span of less than a decade, the naivety of our utopia and our utopian view of the internet um, has evaporated and has given way to a much greater realization of its risks and its dangers. The euphoria about how digital technology, internet platforms, social media, and networks will improve our lives has give a change to a mood which is much more sober. It's, we are much more skeptical about the benefits of these technologies and voice much greater concern about how they could impinge and do impinge on our privacy on the one hand and the unrestrained power of a few technical technological corporations, digital corporations on the other. Critics, and among them we count all three, so in that sense you're not going to have a debate in the sense of a dissent among mm -hmm. them, but they do emphasize various aspects of the debate, so that's, we're going to have a wide range of topics that we will discuss with them. Uh, they have been warning about the dangers to our health due to addiction to the technology, to our freedom due to surveillance, to our democracies due to disinformation and hate campaigns, and to our economies due to unregulated monopolies that control more aspects of our lives than we are aware of, or sometimes even more than we can imagine. And yet for all its problems, the Silicon Valley remains a powerful laboratory, a laboratory of new market solutions. Um, and I'll put it in uh, the words of a recent article by Evgeny Morozov where he says, no other sector occupies such a prominent role in the Western capitalist imaginary or offers such a promising field for regenerative mythologies. As consumers, of course, we've been presented with a plethora of uh, automated goods and services, and we are promised a world of connectivity that could cater to our every whim. It's only now that we are beginning to discover the dark side of this uh, world of platforms and connectivity. A dark side in the sense that it not only is the space in which our um, behavior is being monitored and controlled, it's being predicted with our own help, but it's also being shaped by persuasive technologies. Let me then go on to introduce the three panelists and then turn to them to discuss on all of these topics regarding their own experiences of the last years. Let me start with Roger McNamee, uh, who is unfortunately here not as a musician tonight. He plays bass and guitar in the bands Munalis and Dobby Decimal System. So I hope we'll have a chance to have you back in that role. But today he's here as an investor turned accidental activist, as he says. He's a venture capitalist who has been an investor in Silicon Valley for over 35 years. He co-founded several successful funds in venture crossover and private equity, to name just a few, Elevation Partners, Silver Lake Partners, and he headed the T. Rowe Price Science and Technology Fund. He was an early investor in Facebook and has become extremely critical of its impact on society and especially on democracy in the US, but also elsewhere. He has expressed his views in op-eds for major newspapers and has tried to warn Facebook about the impact of Russian meddling in the 2016 US elections. As part of this effort, he joined the time well spent as a founding advisor, and this year in May, he appeared before an International House of Commons Privacy and Ethics Committee in Ottawa, calling for governments to temporarily shut down Facebook and other social media sites until they reform. For those of you who haven't yet read his book, I would recommend 
sucked, waking up to the Facebook catastrophe, published this year, which details his own experiences of adv adv advising Zuckerberg in vain to reform Facebook. All three of them have books which are outside in the hall in a paperback, available for you for signing afterwards, after we've um, finished our conversation with one another. Let me turn to Evgeny Morozov, who's been here with us before, for some of you who've uh, seen him at the Burke Theatre. He's a prolific author who has long warned against the dangers of the internet and of big data in his explorations of the political and social implications of technology. He's published in the New York Times, New Yorker, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and the London Review of Books. And he has a monthly column for those of you who would rather read him in German in the FAZ, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, in El Pais, and in the Corriere della Sera. He was a visiting professor, a scholar at Stanford University, a fellow at the Open Society Institute, and director of new media at the NGO Transitions Online. In 2011, his first book, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom, won several awards, including the Goldsmith Book Prize and the New York Times Notable Book. It explored the impact of the internet on authoritarian states. It also investigated the growing excitement about the liberating potential of the internet because of the kind of triumphalism that followed the end of the Cold War. And we'll come back to the question of the Cold War as a context in which to think about how to regulate the internet. His second book, To Save Everything, click here, the Folly of Technological Solutionism was published in German as Smarte Neue Welt, Digitale Technik und die Freiheit des Menschen. It warns against the temptation of the digital age to fix everything, from crime to corruption to pollution to obesity, by quantifying, tracking, or gamifying our behavior. Technology can be a force for improvement, he argues, but only if he keeps what he calls solutionism in check, and also learn to appreciate the imperfections of liberal democracy that are part of its very design. He has thus opened with his new writings a fascinating debate on the moral consequences of the use of digital technologies. Max Schrems in the middle, he is probably best known to all of you. He is an Austrian lawyer living in Vienna, well known for his sustained and undaunted campaign against Facebook since 2011, the same year as Evgeny Morozov's book was published, a campaign against Facebook's violation of our privacy, including its violation of European privacy laws and the alleged transfer of personal data to the US National Security Agency, NASA. He's the founder of NOYP, the European Center for Digital Rights, a nonprofit organization founded two years ago 2017, which is based here in Vienna. It aims to launch strategic litigation and media initiatives in support of the GDPR, that is General Data Protection Regulation, and we'll have something to say on that in a moment, and the proposed e-privacy regulation and information privacy in general. I'm sure most of you know his book, Kempf um deine Daten, published in 2014, and among the honors he has received, I just want to mention two, the Internet and Society Award of the Oxford Internet Institute in 2013 and the Theodore Heuss Medal in 2014. He filed suits, three complaints, totaling over 3.9 billion euros under the newly promulgated GDPR regulation in Ireland against Google and Facebook for coercing their users into accepting their data collection policies. And I'll come to his latest complaint in January this year against Amazon, Apple Music, Netflix, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube, so almost everything that you use in your daily life has been the object of at least one case, if not more, by Mark Schrems. And uh, this time, he has sued them for not including sufficient background information or providing insufficient or un unintelligible raw data. His nonprofit has predicted a maximum total fine of 18.8 .8 billion euros for the eight companies under scrutiny. So let me start with you, um, uh, Max, because I think we will begin at the beginning with you, and that is 2011. I think it would be good to recapitulate a little bit the history of your own legal activism against um, uh, Facebook 
located in Ireland. I think the location is not unimportant in the story uh, that you will tell. Uh, the, a complaint filed in 2018, withdrawn in 2014. And for those of you who were probably not among the 25,000 people in Austria who joined the complaint. So this is not a class suit in the American sense, but nevertheless a collective redress um, uh, using Austrian uh, and European uh, law. The case has had a very checkered career through various Austrian courts, and I think it would be good to just hear how it finally came to be rejected by the Austrian Supreme Court, where you have won a victory. So there was so much in this basket, I don't know where to start. <laughs> I think fundamentally what, what we were trying to find is different ways to actually enforce these rights that we have in Europe. Because I think one of the most basic things to understand is um, we do have actually pretty good privacy protections, fundamental right protections. We were just talking outside beforehand that it's kind of interesting that um, a lot of things that are probably politically not possible in the US, or you may um, add on that, um, is actually possible in Europe on a political side. Um, but we're actually notoriously bad at enforcing it in the end. So we usually kind of walk around the world and say we have the best privacy protections, we're the best human rights defenders of the world or whatever, but actually if you then want to enforce your rights, you go pretty much nowhere. Um, you mixed up, like there are tons of different <laughs> procedures we run right now, but fundamentally a couple of problems that we run into usually is that the courts are not overly interested in these cases because they're very complex, very hard to understand. The other side is usually spamming you with 10,000s of pages, so as a judge you're in the middle and you just get swamped with all of this. And um, the costs are oftentimes very extreme, so we have one case pending in Ireland that is about data transfers to the US, so basically a lot of these big US companies have to forward the data to the NSA and to the government because we have what I call kind of a private-public partnership in surveillance, so private companies gather the data and the uh, government then takes it on. And in this case, we have procedural costs alone of around 10 million euros. So I'm technically liable for these 10 million euros. We found a way that I actually don't have to pay it, so <laughs> that's fine. But um, these are all the reasons why I think oftentimes these fundamental rights that we do have we have a very hard time to enforce them, and NOIP, the organization we now started, is basically there to kind of fill that gap, a bit like a consumer rights organization, because um, I usually compare it, there was like a case, for example, in Austria, where I think T-Mobile or some of the telecom companies charge 50 cents for each paper bill, and there are some laws saying that paper bills are for free. No one is gonna sue a company for 50 cents, like no one in the world. Um, but if you do that with millions of people each month, then you actually end up with millions of euros that you get. And these situations is where we have to kind of oftentimes find procedural ways to collectivize that, get everybody together, and then it's reasonable if, let's say, a million people sue, that you then actually have a possibility to enforce this stuff, and that's what we mainly work on. So we're more kind of probably compared to the others on the panel doing like the technical, how can we actually now get this done um, thing, and, and oftentimes not so much the philosophical part of it, and I think that's oftentimes lacking in Europe. That's something where I love to look to the US oftentimes because a lot of these thoughts so and new approaches come out there. to some of the philosophical questions on capitalism in a moment, but before we get there, three quick follow-up questions. What kind of data is being transferred from Europe to the US, which is one of the um, objects of um, uh, the litigation in one case? In the case of Facebook, it's basically all the data that goes there, and under the US law, that's the FISA Act, basically all of this data is subject to surveillance. So the US government can tap into the data and actually pull it from Facebook servers. It needs to be um, necessary for the foreign conduct of the United States, and that's a very, very broad terminology. Um, so that's interesting because any message you send, anything that you oftentimes only send with one other person, is at least technically possible that someone else reads it. They're not gonna do that for all of the people. Um, there are certain systems, one is called Upstream, where they actually scan all that data also, so they actually look for um, actually, you know, um, addresses or strings to pull the data out. And what's important, I think, for privacy in these issues is not just the actual misuse of data, so we don't have a lot of cases that were, you know, dragged off the plane because of that data necessarily, um, but we do have a lot of situations where people then change their behavior, like if I have the feeling that everything that I say online may be tracked and I may not say it, and, you know, stuff like that. So we usually in privacy have these two different levels. The one is the actual misuse of data, if you don't get a credit, if, you know, stuff like that happens, or um, the actual situation where um, just a feeling of surveillance changes your behavior and changes our society somehow. 
So the safe harbor regulation in the EU is not adequate protection for this. So the safe harbor case was the first one we killed that. That was the kind of the, the agreement between the EU and the US on data transfers. We killed the first one, then the European Commission basically three months later took the same text, put a new label on it, called it Privacy Shield, passed it again. We're now in Luxembourg right now killing this again. So it's also a bit of a, you know, back and forth. You kill one thing and then three seconds later they come around with the next thing. Uh, for Austrian audiences, it's a bit like Haider with his um, what's tough on, you know, you kind of, once you, the Supreme Court finds that it was about bilingual signs in Austria, once they find they have to bilingual, they just move it for a meter and say the judgment does not apply anymore because now it's a new sign. That's a bit what the European Commission does in privacy as well. And that's, as a, as a lawyer, sometimes very frustrating, but gotta keep So on. let me move on to something which will uh, bring Roger McNamee into the conversation, and that is, what are the tactics which Facebook has been using against you to prevent these cases from either progressing or to uh, put so many obstacles in the way of these uh, cases progressing that they just take a very, very long time, so they drag out so long and suck up so much of resources that at some point of time one has the feeling the legal battle is not the way to go against Facebook. So the most important thing is that they are headquartered in Ireland, and Ireland notoriously does not enforce European law. Not tax law, not data protection law, nothing else. So it's kind of a safe haven because you can violate EU law without much happening. Um, in our case, for example, you gotta think that, for example, at the Irish DPC, we got recently the answer from Facebook 11 months after they have submitted it. So just by delaying things forever and ever and having regulators that, even in this case, they actually met with the regulator to figure out how to bypass GDPR, so you basically have a regulator that helps you how to avoid the law. Um, and that's kind of the, the major problem we have there. In the other cases, for example, in Austrian case, we simply have a judge here that doesn't want to hear the case, I think, mainly. So she basically um, has refused to hear the case twice, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court tells the judge you have to hear the case. Um, she then again says, I don't want to hear that case, so it goes back up. Um, and in these cases, Facebook usually also tries to discourage you in a way that they spread lies around, they you know, basically say, you know, this person is actually only out there to make money from this. So then it becomes a bit personal, but um, that's stuff that I, I mean, I personally don't care too much about it, but I think that could be uh, something for a lot of people that is uh, making you unhappy. <laughs> Um, so, Roger, you have um, uh, been following these European cases, but uh, uh, they actually don't affect the um, daily workings of Facebook in the U.S. Well, uh, the thing that I would just make sure that everybody understands is the scope of the data that they have and the fundamental philosophical and cultural driver that makes Max's life so difficult. They don't just have the data we give them, mm. right? We think our relationship is that they give us a service we love in exchange for a little bit of personal data and the right to target us with an ad. On top of that, they use a relentless and very effective surveillance technique that has to do with tracking us no matter where we go on the web, but they also acquire data because there's a, f a market for every time we touch a digital system, whether it's in finance, transportation, mobile, so your location from cellular, health, and any other application you may be on. You may have heard that story about women's health products where Facebook is getting data on women's menstrual cycles. They're getting every possible data. If it's Google, they also scan Gmail and Google Docs. Microsoft scans their electronic mail, their documents. These companies have created a data voodoo doll of each and every one of us, whether we use their product or not. So that, when we're talking about the scope of the data that they have, it's huge. And what they do with it is to make behavioral predictions. Professor Shoshana Zuboff, who you may be aware of from Harvard, has talked about this notion of surveillance capitalism and this notion of a market in predictions of our behavior in the effort to manipulate. So what they do culturally, they know more about our attention 
than anyone on earth. And as a result, they know a lot about the attention of policymakers and journalists. And so their entire technique is to stretch everything out beyond the attention span of the people likely to regulate them. And they are really good at it. And the scariest thing is that Mark Zuckerberg is learning how to play politics. He had a very successful trip to Washington, D.C. last week, in total contrast to his first appearance there 18 months ago. And these are things that we need to pay attention to because they have an enormous influence on our mental health and that of our children, on our democracy, on our privacy, and on innovation and competition in the economy. So let me pick up two issues which you've brought up and then turn to uh, you, Evgeny, as well. One is the question of democracy, um, and the other is the question of how it affects our daily behavior. So let me first begin by the term you just introduced, which is Subov's term, surveillance capitalism, and what she tries to describe there is the claim on human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial uh, use practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. So I quote her there. And what she is pointing to, she calls it capitalism gone rogue. Uh, this is something I want to come to in a later uh, stage to talk about, is it capitalism gone rogue? Or this kind of extraction has always been a model of accumulation of capitalism. It's just that it's moved to extraction from data rather than extraction from land or raw material. But what she's pointing to at the moment, I think, which is important to discuss to begin with, is that there is something parasitic in this logic. And the parasitic logic in the production of goods and services is such that it subordinates the entire new global architecture of the use of this technology to behavioral modification. So it's not just that they are tracking what we are doing, they are not only predicting what we are doing, but through the use and actual uh, deployment of persuasive technologies, they are actually modifying our behavior both as consumers and as political actors, as voters. And I think that's something I'd like to talk to both you and Evgeny about, and then I would go on to, of course, more philosophical questions of capitalism because they interest me personally, but that's a different matter to begin with. So I think this power of these digital platforms and technologies in our behavior, on our emotions, and our personalities to nudge, to coax, to... Um, um, shape us to mod modify our behavior is what I would like to talk to you about, both of you first. Do you want me or? or? To, yeah, let's start with you, then I go to Evgeny. Okay, so just so we're clear, Evgeny saw this way before I did, so I want to pay him a huge debt here and say thank you for seeing this. The way this works, it was started by Google around 2000, followed by Facebook after 2010. The notion is that you have billions of users. You want to track life events. So you look, the purchase of a home, the purchase of a car, getting married, having a baby. You look at every life event of all the people in your system and you look at every step for years that precedes that to look for common patterns. And then you identify when each new person start to show the same pattern. And from that, you can make a prediction of the probability that that person is going to buy a car, buy a home, get married, have a baby. And the critical element of this thing is that we're not conscious of this going on. So we go about our business, and they can sell these predictions to marketers, people who want to know. And imagine how different that is from traditional advertising, which was based entirely on demographic targeting. Now we're taking demographic targeting and adding to it something that approximates perfect information about timing. This person, 70% probability of buying a car. This woman has a 90% probability of being pregnant and she does not yet know. Most people don't realize that Google can predict with a remarkable degree of accuracy that a woman is pregnant before she knows it. And you think to yourself, well, what's the harm? 
They just sell that to diaper companies. But they don't. They sell that perfect information to anyone who wants to buy it, including people in the anti-vax community who want to convince that mother not to vaccinate her children. That is very dangerous. And so when you look at what's going on here, the other part of the problem, so they're selling to the marketer perfect information, but where do we get our information? We get it from Google. We get it from Facebook. We treat them as though they are honest brokers, when in fact, they have every incentive not to be honest. So they take that same data voodoo doll and our search results and our news feed reflect what they know about us and they reflect the behavioral predictions that they have sold. That is a problem. Um, Avjini, to turn to you, I think you were among the first who uh, made a very strong claim then, which I think didn't persuade as many people uh, maybe eight years ago as it would do so now. And that was, you said, the internet is not a neutral space. The internet is a space which it's not simply a tool that can be deployed at will and without consequences. So if I were to put it in my words, net delusion, one of the arguments net delusion was making was to say there's a Faustian compact. We are using these tools and we are using them in everyday life. And one of the problems is that we have an illusion about how we could control them. And yet in a way they do control us, and it's not only about our individual use of these tools as customers, users of uh, the uh, internet, Facebook, whatever, but it's also the default model, the platform capitalism, these platforms are also the default model on which all internet business functions. So there are two sides to this story which your writings have been dealing with, and I think it would be wonderful if mm -hmm. you could elaborate both. Sure. Well, I think uh, one of the more fundamental lessons that I try to share with the world, so to say, maybe as early as 2010, 2011, was that not only were we naive or optimistic about the internet as a tool, but we were uh, wrong to treat it as a tool to begin with, right? And this idea of reducing it to some kind of an instrument uh, a medium, if you will, or uh, a neutral, or any kind of technology which has certain predefined fixed characteristics. It's good for democracy, or it's good for tyranny, it's good for dictators, or it's good for the public sphere. That in itself was a very naive conception of how reality actually worked. The uh, thing that we call the internet had a political economy behind it, uh, it had the geopolitics behind it. It had the historical legacy of the Cold War behind it. And uh, it could also look very different, right? And this idea of a very different set of tools which don't have to be used for oppression, which don't have to be used for behavioral modification, but attached to a different geopolitics, attached to a different political economy, and attached to a somewhat different political agenda could actually be emancipatory. I mean, that was, I think, it was not formalized and crystallized so maybe crisply at the beginning, but I think uh, over the years, that what my critique added up to. I think a lot of people misread and misunderstood my argument in thinking that I was just trying to somehow uh, show that there is this darker side and the reality is the opposite of what we think it is. In fact, my argument was much more complex, if you will, that we tend to present complex structures and processes as tools, and that in itself was the wrong move. And I, you know, <laughs> I have jokingly, in my second book, which came out in 2013, I imposed a moratorium on myself on ever using the term internet as part of serious discourse, because back then it was already clear to me it was quite meaningless, because the internet of China is not the internet of the United States, and the internet dominated by Facebook is not an internet dominated by some kind of decentralized grassroots effort. So to talk about the internet as if that was something fixed was already a mistake. And I think that in itself, is there some sound thing? 
And that in itself has led me uh, down the path of trying to imagine what that alternative might be. I'm sure we'll go back to that. We'll come back but to that. But ultimately, that was my message, that we were too quick in um, conceiving something uh, as technology when, in fact, it was something very different. And we have that tendency, you, know, you all know it, that that's also the way we talk about television, even though you very well know that uh, publicly financed media and television, for example, that you still have to some extent in Austria, is very different from what you get if you turn to Fox News. Right? We will talk about both of them as television, but clearly they're not the same thing. And I think a lot of our thinking about the internet was, and platforms was dominated by this mentality, that there is some kind of a universalist perfect form, and Google and Facebook have embodied them. That's why they have such an easy time now. You know, you go and try to convince people that Google is not really all that innovative, that there are, they're also presenting many structural obstacles to innovation because they are sitting on a lot of data that other people cannot use, for example. Uh, and when you try to tell that to people, it's very hard to communicate that because people already treat Google as the highest point of civilization and humanity, <laughs> and nothing better can ever be invented. Right? And that has to do with this conception that we have accustomed ourselves over the years. No, I, I take your point on this, and I come back to the monopoly question, which is this raises, and I come back to that uh, with, uh, to you, Roger, in a moment. But Evgeny, this almost sounds as if uh, this is technology out there, and it is for us to shape what kind of a political economy it could inhabit and what kind of geopolitics it could have. Given the political economy mm -hmm. that it is part of, the landscape of political economy of which these corporations are a part, don't you think one of the questions is the asymmetry of transparency, that these technologies can make us completely transparent to the corporations, but the corporations are able to render themselves completely opaque to us, as uh, uh, Max Schrems points out, or through the transfer of data from Europe to the US, it's not just that our lives become transparent to Google and Facebook, but the US government also is able to use these to surveil our lives. Vice versa is an impossibility. Mm. No, no, sure. I mean, that's this epistemic asymmetry is one of the key points I make, you know, in, 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 in that book. And, you know, it was obvious to me that clearly we are far more transparent and far more is expected of us than of the institutions, but also mm -hmm. of the uh, technology companies. But I guess, uh, I'm not sure if you were alluding to this or not, but clearly I was not trying to suggest that we could shape this technology any way we want if we would only imagine and will it. You know, it's not some kind of a idealistic project of us just trying to imagine an alternative internet and that internet would come into existence. That would clearly require a political, a geopolitical and economic struggle. It would require, you know, in this day and age, massive funding to build resources like artificial intelligence, think about them as a public good as opposed to a privatized commodity. All of those things need to be in place and political campaigns mm -hmm. must be built around them. Uh, but I still think that, you know, despite all of the pessimism of the intellect that I get as an Eastern European, you know, I also need some optimism of the will. <laughs> so this is where this part comes in, right? I mean, we still I... need to be able to imagine um, what exactly we want to succeed this current digital economy that we want. And then we need to understand what kind of politics do we want? Because mm -hmm. once you realize that the kind of politics needed to fix this digital mass are missing, and more, most major political parties are not even aware of the transformation they themselves need to do in order to get there, then you really get depressed. <laughs> no, I don't want everyone to get depressed, and I do want us to leave with some kind of your optimism, but before that, I do want to look at the monopolistic nature of the huge concentration of wealth, power, information that has accrued to these companies. I mean, I think in a sense it's unprecedented the kind of monopolies that they have been able to build up. And one of the things one learns uh, from your book, Roger, is the fact that 
this is partly an artifact of the uh, post-Reagan uh, neoliberal um, economic environment in which the Silicon Valley companies that we are looking at have coming up because the antitrust legislation, uh, regulation before that would really have made life very difficult for them. So the fact that they are able to build up such monopolies has something to do with the kind of regulatory or the absence of the regulatory environment in which they operate today. Well, uh, there are two th or three things that really drove it, and one of the core ones Evgeny's just really talked about. When his first book came out, when you started talking about that, my assumption was that there would be a learning curve, that people would recognize that there were really serious issues with that, the people running the companies. And one of the things to understand is the culture, both in Silicon Valley and in American business, which essentially... You know, we began deregulating in the very late 1970s. So before that, our government <clears throat> maintained markets very carefully with very severe restrictions on concentration of economic power. Beginning in the late 70s, we began to deregulate. And for the first 10 years of that, it unleashed extraordinary growth across essentially the whole economy. Almost the whole population participated. The second decade, saw diminishing returns, but still positive numbers. The last 20 years have seen what I would characterize as an economic disaster, with about one-tenth of one percent of the population getting essentially all the benefits. So the context for this is a larger U.S. problem, where we went from having lots of rules governing business to having very few, and essentially no enforcement. Smart people were encouraged to grab whatever they could get. And the people at Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft are very smart people. So the environment that they're operating in is also the same environment that allowed US banks and a few European banks to destroy the global economy in 2008, essentially without punishment. So a, a perception developed in the minds of these people that they did not, in fact, have to respond to any kind of negative stimulus, whether it was regulatory, moral, political, or whatever. And this is the thing that I, as a professional analyst, missed. That my conversations with Mark Zuckerberg, my conversations especially with Sheryl Sandberg, would often focus on the need to integrate these ideas, to learn from these, what I perceived as mistakes. And the problem is, culturally, they perceived these things as huge wins. Their goal was to eliminate friction. That their business model was based on a philosophy of efficiency. They essentially took an engineering concept designed for ideally small systems and applied it to society as a whole. Google first, then Facebook, now Amazon and Microsoft. They're optimizing for efficiency and their notion is that if the world's more efficient, there'll obviously be much more wealth, and people will be less stressed because they won't have to make so many decisions. The problem is that the two largest sources of inefficiency that they can address relate to personal choice and democracy. And that is a huge problem because they're essentially replacing personal choice and democracy with algorithms. And I don't think they're doing it on purpose. It's just they have this laser focus on their own needs and as a consequence, an insensitivity to the needs of the larger community. And their, their brilliance is very narrowly defined. So they do not have as complete an understanding of the values of the Enlightenment as I had given them credit for in the era that I advised them. And I think when Evgeny brought out his ideas, it was the sort of thing where, in a different time, people would have reacted and said, ah, here is an opportunity for us to adjust, to make changes, and to do better. And instead, what you had was, wow, our business model is succeeding. We're eliminating friction. We're going from very small to very large. And by redefining the economy away from oil and land and natural resources, towards data, they redefined it in a way where the set of potential competitors was reduced to three, 
So a total of four companies. And in that context, they had essentially no natural predators and they became predators on the entire economy. So they started with journalism, they went to other media, but now they're beginning to work on financial services, consumer packaged goods, transportation, and they'll work their way through the rest of the economy unless we stand up and say, you know what? We don't think that's the way this should go down. I have like three short points, I think, just to add to, to what you guys have said before. Um, first, a very short footnote. Um, we talked about US um, government surveillance, but what we also got to say that, for example, the UK, France, and so on has very similar surveillance programs, just as a footnote, to not say that the US will be the only country to do things like that. Um, but on the other points you were making, I think one interesting thing to look at that, like from a lawyer's perspective now with these information imbalance issues, is how we can come up with regulations to cope with that. I think we're at the very, very beginning of all of this, but if you look, for example, at, at the legislation, you have a right to access. Not gonna solve any of these issues fundamentally, but at least philosophically, it gives you possibility to see what the company stores about you and gives you some transparency in that way. Or towards the government, you usually have a Freedom of Information Act, so you can basically get the information from them in any civilized country but Austria, because we don't have that. Um, but, um, or the right to privacy that kind of protects you versus the other side. So you have kind of a, you can think of that a bit of a like informational redistribution, that's how I usually try to call it, like informationale umverteilung, um, a bit like in a capitalistic society where we redistribute wealth through taxes and so on. The question is how can we find tools in that direction that are then operable in itself because that's the biggest problem. The other thing on the competition side, what I usually try to float as much as possible, I think we actually tried, had a very nice system in Europe to cope with many, many of these um, competition issues. We usually had interoperability and open networks. And the EU has pushed that through tons of industry sectors. You can have 20 different power companies out of the same plug in European household. You can have, I don't know, hundreds of different internet providers in the same plug. If I tell that anybody of my friends in the US, they're like stuck with AT&T and that's the only possibility you have. So we kind of opened these things up. And the interesting thing is now when we have these monopolies sitting on top of the internet, how much we can use these tools that we've used for 20 or 30 years in other sectors and apply it here as well. And that I think would not just be interesting on, on the topics we've, we've covered so far, but also on the economic side, because as a European company, you can then actually compete with a social network. You can say, we do a better social network, and if I can still chat with people that are on Facebook and not lose all my friends if I lose, go to another social network, then it's much more likely that I actually switch, that another you know, innovative product comes up. And I think that would be an approach that would be very typical for what we've done in other sectors, and that could you know, be at least a starting point in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Evgen, I want to come back to one point uh, uh, which you made about this is not a tool, but it is a different kind of um, animal that we are dealing with. I think one aspect which I would like to have you elaborate on would be the idea that some people are saying, this is not just about um, collecting and controlling information, but that actually some of these companies are uh, monopolies which control the entire infrastructure of our societies and economies. And so it's like uh, if, if there is a, a, a problem with Uber, for example, I mean, sharing economy is something which most people think is a good thing, but then it comes to, for example, let's think of Uber. Uh, first of all, of course, you're monetizing everything which you have. So I have a car, I monetize it. I have a flat, I turn it into Airbnb. But leave that aside as an issue. If you, what, is the, what happens to the whole question of accountability when Uber says we are not a transport company at all, we are just a platform and therefore we are not accountable for any goods and services which are being uh, sold here and therefore what you are getting is ownership of infrastructure rather than ownership of just information. Sure, I think that's the correct way to think about it. You know, if you follow some of the analysts who write about it, professionally, I mean, of course, they would talk about the stack, right? So it's not just about one layer, it's not just mm -hmm. about cables, it's not just about data, it's about cables, data, AI, and whatever the next smart city and whatever the next technology would be. And it happens that for the current generation of leaders in this field, like Google, it makes sense to control the whole stack, so to say, but controlling just one part of it, 
can do as much damage to us, right? And this is where I think we need to, uh, you know, we have a choice, essentially, and this is where maybe I will disagree slightly with Roger, or maybe I will complicate a little bit what he said. Um, you know, we, we, we have choices of how to frame this debate about the digital economy. We can have a humanistic reading of it, where we put the individual at the center, and where we basically do what, for example, Shoshana Zubov has done in her book on surveillance capitalism, where we really try to relate everything that happens in the digital economy to how our subjectivity is formed, how it's shaped, how our free will is being limited or enhanced, so forth. Um, you know, that's a debate where technology companies, I think, don't really have such a weak position because they really start from this very strong culture of self-help in California, a very individualistic uh, uh, you know, mentality, but also it, to some extent, maps back on the experience of the users who do feel, to some extent, empowered, quote-unquote, by some of the technologies that they use. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag, this humanistic framing. Then you have a second framing, which is the one I prefer, which uh, does not eliminate the individual, and, you know, and of course it's a much better narrative when you put the individual at the center, but it still tries to focus on the political economy of things and tries to understand whether there are reasons to worry about Google or Amazon or Huawei or any of the other companies, even if the entire interaction with the digital economy is not through individuals, users, consumers, but through other clients, governments, government departments, cities, municipalities, and so forth. I mean, should I be less worried about Google running the National Health Service uh, of the United Kingdom if their only interaction is with the NHS and not with the individual patients? Or should I be more worried about that, right? And should I be worried about it for reasons other than those connected to psychology and my behavior? Should we be connected to the question of how welfare should be provided? Right? And I think those are two competing frameworks uh, which we should not mix. And I think they all have their virtues. Some of them, like the humanistic one, is much easier to communicate. The other one, I think, ultimately gets things right more of the time and also maps a somewhat alternative path of action. Because with the humanistic framing, the natural impulse would be to say, okay, well, I want all of the goods of Google, but without the behavioral manipulation bit, which is where, you know, Roger would come in and say, okay, we'll just pay to Google to offer us the same services, and we'll pay Facebook to offer us the same services, and we'll have a happy subscription-based Facebook where there will be no advertising, and as a result, there will be no behavioral manipulation. Uh, then, you know, my political economy approach would pose a question mark. Uh, do we consider communication a fundamental need and good that perhaps should be financed differently, like we have financed education, like we have financed health, mm -hmm. transportation, and so forth. And if so, then the idea of fully privatizing it by having consumers pay for those services now is not such a good idea, right? So this is where I think we can really have a very productive debate. The extent to which they're monopolists or not monopolists, no, it's an interesting question, but again, once you put the political economy behind it, you start understanding that what drives these companies is not data accumulation. It's not data extractivism. It's profit. And if there is an area of business, which Roger would know very well as a venture capitalist, which offers you more money than manipulating human behavior, like cloud computing and artificial intelligence now do, these companies move there, right? And they start offering services to governments, to municipalities and to others, to CIA, to the Pentagon, where every single firm now is bidding for a big military contract, where there is no user, and there is no citizen, and there is no consumer, and there are no elections. To me, those cases are not any less troubling than those where Facebook directly intermediates our interaction. I take your point entirely. Roger, on that. And I, I agree. To me, it's an issue of sequencing. They began with behavioral manipulation, they began with surveillance capitalism. But demonstrably, if you look at what Google is doing, Google has a smart cities project that they call uh, Sidewalk Labs. Facebook has a uh, reserve currency project called uh, uh, Libra. And then they obviously have artificial intelligence products. And they are now both they and Amazon and Microsoft are contracting things from government, which I find deeply disturbing. And 
the evolution in their markets is something that is, you know, at the moment, overwhelming the ability of policymakers to make a rational response. And in my mind, it starts from a very simple problem, which is that convenience is a narcotic. And we all, as individuals, are addicted to convenience. And government agencies are addicted to the convenience of getting amazing services without paying cash for them. And it is, you know, there is, they, they choose the convenience because they misprice what they are giving up. They do not understand what the actual cost is to them or the benefit to the other side. And I have spent less time than these two uh, trying to bring this to public attention, but in the four years I've been doing it, it has become incredibly clear to me that we're not gonna make any progress at all if everyone in this room does not leave here with a clear understanding that we require a political solution and a political solution will only happen if citizens, if voters are willing to lend their support. And that means almost certainly a willingness, if not the fact of giving up a little bit of convenience for a little while in order to produce a better long-term outcome than the one we have. And I don't know whether we're gonna get there or not. So I spend most of my time trying to give people a sense of what's going on and ask them to join me in a thought experiment to imagine what if what I say or what if what these guys say is actually true. In five years, what will we wish we had done today? Will we, you have a, an election coming up this weekend, right? Wouldn't you like to insist to politicians that this issue be a priority? In the United States, my whole focus is to make this a core issue of our 2020 election. And it's been really hard, but it's not impossible. We're making progress. Because it turns out, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about climate change, gun violence, the campaign to connect vaccination to autism, and all the other conspiracy theories that are out there. All of these political problems are made worse by the business model of internet platforms. So if we want Greta Thunberg to be successful, we're going to have to limit the ability of YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to give excessive political power to the people who deny climate change. And that's something that is actually within our power. That's why I'm optimistic. Because I think if I talk to enough people, if these two talk to enough people, we're gonna get the political support we need. Because at least in the United States, a country that is totally pol polarized on every other issue. The population more or less agrees that there's a problem here. They don't necessarily understand what it is and they for sure don't know what to do about it. But it's on everybody's radar and more or less the people who've made up their mind are in the same place irrespective of where they are on every other issue. And I'd like to believe we can make that global because here in Europe you have a values model that's different than the United States. You believe in human rights as a really core value. And treating data as a human right, not an asset. That's something that will be a lot easier. I mean, maybe we can't get the enforcement right, as Max would say, but maybe we got a shot to make that happen. And I think it's more likely to happen here than in the United States which is why I'm here tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> first, <laughs> this is the first optimistic note struck today, which is good, so I'm going to pursue this. No, it's, it's actually, the optimism thing is really important because, yep. you know, technology's not inevitable, right? The genius of what these two did was 
four or five years before anybody else. They understood there was a really serious problem and they got different pieces of it right. And I read their stuff, I watched what they were doing and I assumed that the people I knew in Silicon Valley were smart enough and mature enough to recognize that this was stuff they needed to internalize and adjust their strategies around. And they didn't. Well, guess what? We have to be the adults. We have to force them to become good citizens. We have to recognize that have, living our whole life in Google has a really huge cost. We give them too much power. And for at least a while, we gotta step back and ask, what do we really want? Do we want democracy? Do we want our children to grow up in an environment where they get to make their own choices? Right? Do we want to have an Austrian entrepreneurial technology industry? Because all these things are possible, but all of us have to get involved. And the fact that you came out tonight, like I'm sitting here going, that's half the battle, <laughs> just showing up. So thank you. <laughs> So I think we have a difference of opinion here on this one, and I think we need to pursue this for the moment. Uh, the question on the one hand, I think three points raised here are interesting for me. On the one hand, the question is, why ha should we be lobbying policymakers? Um, if so, uh, are we really convinced uh, that uh, politicians have the power to regulate this through um, a different kind of uh, legal uh, regulations? And if that's the case, why have they been so oblivious to... Uh, well, to be legal? clear, I'm really with Evgeny on this issue. I think the power to say no is a starting point. Because right? Evgeny has a very different idea of how to go about... It's not about political persuasion. It's uh, not about uh, legal um, uh, obstacles uh, which should be put in the way of the corporations gaining the kinds of power they have. Uh, but to rethink the entire conception, if I may put it in my words in, in just one sentence, and you can correct me if uh, this is right, but that you are saying, let's not consider this kind of data as just something which is their ownership or ours, we can think of it as a public good, we can think of it in terms of commons, we can think of the entire technology as embedded in a different kind of political economy uh, so that the choices which we have would be very different from trying to lobby either what the corporations are making us believe, leave it to the market, uh, because this is the mantra uh, in the 90s and 2000s, leave it to the market, the market will be able to get this right. The opposite would have been the state will get it right, leave it to state regulation, so let's go to policymakers, let's go to politicians, let's try and see if we can get the law courts to enforce something which the politicians have not seen so far. And what Evgen is saying is let's rethink the vision of what the whole system and its design could be like. So it's a much, much more fundamental critique of, I think, the entire political economy Agreed. of the way in which Silicon Valley operates. So I think the question is, these are not possibly mutually exclusive alternatives, but the mm -hmm. question is, how do legal and political mobilization go together? Uh, is, I mean, how, it's, it's a very poorly regulated area in which that's actually law is not as strong as it could be. I think that's fundamentally wrong. Um, I think, at, at least, for example, for the privacy part, I think also from, your, from what you said before, we, are, we have taken that first step, for example, at least on, on, on the privacy level in Europe. It was possible to pass a rather stringent law in the EU. Um, it's by far not the best law. It's like the, the least stupid privacy law in the world, probably, um, to frame it that way. But uh, things that I think in the US are just politically impossible to do are possible here. Um, we have a huge problem with the quality of the lawmakers. We have a huge problem with, with having lawmakers that actually have vision and so on. But I think the, the idea that this is so hard to overcome or, or push through, I was in this whole GDPR negotiation in Brussels. It was amazing what was actually done 100% against all the lobbies. They were basically, I mean, all the Facebooks and so on were basically washed off the tables to a large extent. I think that is something we can be reasonably proud of. Um, so I think that is not necessarily the biggest problem. The bigger issue is to have vision and how to go from here because GDPR is a very dumb 
raw data regulation law. It doesn't do anything about AI. It doesn't do anything about the market problems. It doesn't do anything about all these more sophisticated issues. But I think that's the problem that we're oftentimes lacking in Europe to, to get that done and off the, off, off, the, um, off the ground and also to have input in Brussels of people that, that are able to do that. But I think politically it's doable. That's the thing I'm the least worried about. Is it po politically doable in the US? Why are you, I mean, I, I remember this uh, chapter in your book, uh, Mr. McNamee goes to Washington, and Mr. McNamee didn't have a very easy time in Washington. I, so here's the really important thing. The world of my book was designed to teach people the world as I understood it a year and a half ago. And we've learned a lot since then. And Evgeny's core point here, I think, is really key. So when I look at politics, the most important stuff I look at is we have to buy time. The legal system works very slowly. The political system works very slowly. Consumer behavior changes very slowly. And the companies move super fast. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to do what we did in the United States with antitrust law relative to AT&T, which is to create a fence around a portion of their business and say, I'm sorry, you cannot do more than that. And I think two years ago, if you had told me that the United States antitrust system would actually be spinning up and doing things at both the federal and the state level, I would have thought that was inconceivable. Mm. We still haven't done anything yet, so nothing may come of it, but we've made more progress than I would have thought was possible. And I think it's distinctly possible to stop Google's I uh, sorry, Facebook's reserve currency, Libra. And I think the city of Toronto may stop Google's smart cities project there long enough to make it not as dangerous as it was going to be. But to my mind, the challenge, I don't know how to solve. Evgeny, we should let him talk because I think he has a clear idea of how to solve this thing. I just know that stopping them from doing it while to buy us time is absolutely essential. I come back to you with a point which you made in a recent article of yours in the um, New Left Review, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the whole question uh, of the discussion uh, by an Austrian, uh, Maya Schoenberg, on uh, the New Deal on data, and which has received enormous public support in the UN, uh, in the uh, European Commission, uh, partly because I suspect, uh, maybe a little unfairly, that the deal is going to cost the governments nothing. Uh, so this is the reason why they think this could be the way to go and that it would formalize property rights around intangibles so that individuals can own the data which they produce, but it would make us into passive consumers and nothing much more. And would that be one way to go, to build an alternative data sharing base. I mean, the Germans, interestingly, the last the Austrian government went that way with one idea picked uh, from the book, and the SPD in Germany, the Social Democrats, also jumped onto the bandwagon. Uh, but the question is, is that, for example, a concrete alternative? Give me such softball questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, before I answer that, let me just clarify your summary of kind of my view, which I heard before, which I don't think is entirely accurate. So, uh, I mean, we are working here and now, you know, it's 2019, there is a trade war going on between the US and China, Europe is somehow involved in it. Uh, we have a lot of other problems on the political front in Europe. I mean, we should not forget those things. So to say that we should just engage in philosophizing and uh, come up with some kind of a better intellectual framework, I think is deeply responsible and I would never recommend such a thing on its own. Uh, clearly, we cannot afford not to engage politicians and policymakers, if only because you have to understand that Europe, and I'm thinking here as a European, and the interests of Europe here are clearly at odds to those of the United States. Uh, Europe has maybe a window of five years to put its act together, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, if it doesn't put its act together, it will find itself in the kind of technological dependency that you know, Latin America was in the 60s or that you know, many of Africa maybe still is, um, where the most important productive facet of the economy, which would be artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, sensor networks, would not be under its control, they would not be under its ownership, and it would essentially depend on 
Chinese or American provided sensors in the cars, in the houses, in the cities, mm -hmm. and so forth. Unless we have a short-term plan for how we are going to navigate those five years when it comes to trade policy, competition policy, geopolitical alignment, uh, finding a way to play the Chinese off the Americans while doing something on our own, none of what I'm going to say is going to matter. I mean, all these philosophical frameworks, they'll be implemented in our heads, or they'll be implemented you know, 200 years from now, there'll be literally nobody to implement them. It will not be the Americans, and it will not be the Chinese who will try to think about data as a commons. So if you even want to preserve some space for maneuver, I think we have to engage with the policymakers. Now, uh, the second problem that we face, and you're very well aware of it, is that the traditional political forces that have traditionally stood up to the most violent and uh, corrupt and uh, you know, painful manifestations of capitalism uh, are not up to their game either. Mm -hmm. Social democratic parties, complete crisis, ideologically, yes. they don't know what they stand for, they don't know what they want to do. All they want to do is to maintain some kind of conservative defense agenda of the welfare state, which, you know, nice, but it prepares you absolutely nothing, <laughs> and not at all, to the challenge of rebuilding uh, our economy and our society around this new set of technologies. Trade unions are doing a few nice things, but again, not ideally placed to actually do anything in this space either. So you end up, and you know, of course, you have Arbeiterkammer here, and they've been also supporting Max work. so I mean, it's not entirely all that <laughs> dark and negative, but we have to understand that there is no such thing as disengagement from this political layer. Mm. Uh, now that I've cleared the way, we can come to the kind of idea space, and this is where I think we have to understand that you have projects from Silicon Valley, which are basically leave everything as it is, and we will make sure that things come to you for free. Right? And I think we should not underestimate that persuasive element of the rhetoric, because the reason I think also, by the way, while, why the monopolization of this sector was allowed to continue was because ultimately their services do reduce the reproduction costs <laughs> to some extent because they're free for most of us. We don't pay for them, but we you harvest pay for them services. Indirectly. So uh, sure, we pay for them indirectly, but if your incomes are stag if your income is stagnating, you have no salary increase whatsoever, and all of a sudden you can get you know, a babysitter or whatever, or Alexa will you know, tell you uh, what to do. You know, that does, for all the skepticism about friction, that does increase, it doesn't reduce certain efficiencies into how we live and how we consume. The same thing, by the way, about Uber and Airbnb. We should not forget that in the aftermath of the financial crisis, they have helped quite a few people to pay their bills which also explains why so many people are on their side when it comes to regulation. So we should not have a historical reading of this industry. Mm -hmm. But that aside, we have to understand that the options right now, as they crystallize, are of three kinds. Leave everything as it is and hope that this frictionless environment built by Google and Amazon would benefit us, which is something I don't really believe in. Second option is to basically treat data as a commodity and introduce property rights around it, the way we have done with other types of knowledge before, you know, books, uh, drugs, you know, and whatnot, and find a way to basically compensate people who produce some of the data for their contribution. So you can think of many schemes, and Silicon Valley is also busy thinking about them. You, know, you can build a basic income scheme where you will be paid a dividend of some kind every month based on the data that you contribute to some giant fund, for example, right? Or you can uh, somehow formalize the data rights to the data you produce and then sell that data on a secondary market. You know, the sky is the limit here, which of course, again, leads to marketization and financialization of data. We have the third option, which is the least ill, which is the most ill-defined uh, of the three and which does not have obvious political backers behind it, which is to try to think about how a lot of the social, political, and cultural institutions that we have traditionally defended and associated with the welfare state, with bureaucracy, with administration, with you know, a normally functioning economy, how they can all be rethought uh, given the new possibilities of production and coordination that are afforded by digital technologies. Mm -hmm. Can we think of a radically different transportation system? Can we think of a radically different healthcare system? 
Can we think of a more decentralized education system where we all can teach each other something using the new digital technologies? And if we can, would we like that? Uh, do we want to put it in place because it will actually empower citizens, some of whom might feel alienated even under the most generous and well-functioning welfare state that ever existed? Do we want to make that transition? And would that transition actually deliver more benefits than staying on the Google and Amazon path? And this third path, I think, is where the forces on the social democratic and leftist part of the aisle, including institutions like the trade unions, should be moving. You know, instead of trying to think how we can humanize Silicon Valley, they should start thinking about how we can build alternative institutions of solidarity, collaboration, and mutual support that will be enabled by digital technologies, but that would not be financed by Saudi Arabia, who, by the way, finances probably 80% of the services you use through SoftBank's uh, fund, which funds all of these big startups, and they would not be funded by the Pentagon, and they would not be funded by Google, nor would they pursue their agendas. And I think it's a completely rational set of questions to ask, and unfortunately, because we have this geopolitical weakness on the one hand, I described, and we have this institutional weakness, weakness. where the parties are missing and the trade unions are missing and the NGOs are missing and, you know, all the NGOs that we have would like to talk about ethics of algorithms instead of how to rebuild society that we have. Mm -hmm. We end up in this intellectual stalemate where we end up with those two default options and none of them are particularly good. So yes, I would like to channel you, more resources, yeah. mm. intellectual firepower, political firepower, into trying to think how we can give more beef, sort of intellectual beef and institutional kind of shape to this third alternative. Yeah, and to change the terms of the debate. So I think that is, mm -hmm. uh, it is a different uh, way of thinking about uh, the problem uh, at hand. I don't know if either of you want to join this discussion because otherwise I have two questions to put to are, you. Are those the only three options? Yes, do. <laughs> what, what, what? Are those the only three options? Um, <laughs> if you give him Europe, time, he will come up with some I would say more. that yes. Well, you have others? So do you have another answer? option? <laughs> well, I mean, to me, to me, I look Can at Can I just say one thing? Because, you know, and then I'll, 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 I'll let you criticize it all you want. I mean, you have to understand that I'm not trying to solve the problem of the digital economy. I'm trying to solve the problem of the fact that, you know, we have a collapsing phase in our political system. Our social democratic parties no longer deliver. Our welfare state has some money, but it will run out and we'll have to rely on these technology companies more and more. That's the problem that we have and we cannot ignore it. Of course, I can imagine a better Facebook, but imagining a better Facebook in a system that's crumbling and collapsing and is losing face of citizens, it's useless because it's never get built. So I start from the world we have, and the world we have is crumbling on many other fronts which have nothing to do with the digital economy. So the solution I'm trying to articulate somehow tries to take note mm -hmm. of all this crisis that we have on multiple fronts. Yeah. The crisis that we have is not just caused by the fact that Facebook played a role in 2016 elections. Mm. Clearly, I mean, in Europe, we've seen it with the refugees crisis, with you know, the rise of populism here, with all Brexit. sorts of other issues, Brexit, well, Brexit included, right? There are systematic structural issues which the digital economy illustrates, sometimes it amplifies them, but there is absolutely no solution and hope for us of resolving the digital question if we also do not resolve those other ones. So I was really more focused on sequence. So I accept completely your point about fixing Facebook or Google doesn't help if we don't also fix the fact that representative democracy around the Western world is dying, that power has shifted to a very small percentage of the population in many countries, and therefore the vast majority of people are left out. My question was really whether stopping the core strategy of Facebook and Google wouldn't give you the time necessary to do the thing you're talking about here. So to me, I look at this and I say, it's like climate change. You're never going to solve climate change if you let Google and Facebook continue to do the things that they're doing every single day because their business model on the old version, the part that's about surveillance capitalism, will always amplify the angriest voices in society because that is the content that generates the most engagement. So hate speech, disinformation, conspiracy theories will always get wildly better play. And that's just 
a structural part of their current economy. So my thought process, accepting completely your third notion, so I'm totally aligned with you there, was wouldn't it be helpful to paralyze them while you tried to come up with that model? Because it seems to me that the rate of change of society is predictably slower than the rate of change of Google and Facebook. And that having once been empowered by 9-11 to build a surveillance state, to then create surveillance economy, to get this massive wealth that they have now, that we are inevitably going to wind up with them running every institution in, say, five years. And so my thought process was stop them cold because you need 20 years to do the thing you're talking about. Yes. And so I want to use U.S. antitrust law to paralyze them, but I also want to use criminal law because... In, at least in the United States, the securities law, the things for stocks, has a very specific rule that you're not allowed to lie to investors about your revenue, about your user count, about how long people watch your ads. Mm -hmm. And people in the marketing industry believe that there's been systematic overstatement of those numbers for 10 years. And so I'm trying to find lawyers in the United States to do the equivalent of what Max is doing, but to pierce Google's absolute monopoly because the reason there's no transparency is that Google has complete control. And to make it criminal because the threat of jail time will have a much, shall we say, will change the negotiating dynamic. So not only do I not want to criticize your thing, I'm trying to actually see if we can't figure out if there's a way to buy the time to do the thing you're talking about. And because I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't see it. I see the timeline of them implementing their control stuff as being relatively short, and the timeline for the thing you're talking about being longer, which is why I want all your help to stop them now. And it's not going to work if you sit there and go, I'm sorry, I can't give up Google Docs. <laughs> Can I respond to your... Brief? Yes, I, I'm going to turn to uh, Max in a moment on, because everything now rests on the law at this point of time in Roger's argument. No, no, you actually, I'm talking about changing the demand. <laughs> I'm talking uh, about changing demand. Roger, but I mean, but this is where you need to bring, I think, a stronger geopolitical perspective and understand that as much as Europe would like, it does not really enjoy uh, autonomous independent policy when it comes to trade or taxation. I mean, you can just look at the example of the last few months where France, not the weakest member of the European Union, tried to enact a digital services tax only to be told by everybody from Trump onwards that this is absolutely to be avoided. The only sovereign power with the ability to tax these firms is the United States. And unfortunately, as long as you have 800 military bases around the globe, that would always be a response that every other country would have to swallow. And, you know, in my, I, like, I fully appreciate what you do in the United States with trying to use the power of law to break them up or to constrain them. But I wouldn't trust America to fully constrain this industry any more than I would trust the British Empire to constrain the East India Company. So let me concede that point. <laughs> we have a 2020 election coming up, right? And it's interesting because we have a candidate in the United States, in Elizabeth Warren, who is at least 70% aligned with the vision I'm talking about. And again, maybe it won't work, but I want to leave everybody with something positive. I don't want to... I don't want to make the thing a null set because I don't think this is on Europe to do the whole thing. But I do know that the management structures of these companies look like a large loaf of bread with a tiny antenna going a million miles in the air with three or four people at the top. And that's the management team. And they are remarkably easy to overwhelm if you can create brush fires in lots of different places at the same time. I mean, we learned this with Microsoft. It can be done here as well because they're so concentrated. At Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg really makes every strategic decision. And all we have to do is force him to... If the United Kingdom says, Mark, we're going to shut down Facebook and Instagram until you testify. If Sri Lanka does what it did. If you think Boris Johnson would do that? No, no I'm, I'm no, no, trying no, to be very realistic. No, I don't believe you... Sorry. I don't believe he will do it today, okay? But I don't know how long he's going to be prime minister. And I make, I make the very simple point that 
things are fluid right now. And if we make this part of the political agenda in every country, we have a chance. And if we don't make it part of the political agenda, I don't see how we get, I mean, right now, I wonder how many people in Europe recognize the importance of rebuilding all the institutions. I mean, if you look in the United Kingdom, half of the Conservative Party is for Brexit, half of the Labour Party is for Brexit. I mean, that's like, it proves your point, right? And in the United States, we have the opposite thing. We have one party that's basically for white supremacy, and the, the other party is way over here, and there's like a gazillion people in the middle who don't know who to talk to. And I don't know how to fix any of those problems, right? I'm not trained the way you guys are. But when I look at the problem, I look at it like, we gotta start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't get everybody in the room working with us, it's gonna be really hard to fix this. I don't see a top-down solution here. And, and that's all I'm saying. I just, I, I wanna to get to your thing, and I wanna know what, what I can do. What's the thing I'm supposed to do when I go out, when I go home, right? I'm going home on Sunday. <laughs> on Monday, what am I supposed to do? I'm going to say one thing that, well, I'll give Max the word in a moment, but what Max has a very concrete problem to solve that maybe someone in the room can help him with, and that is, he cannot find five lawyers who will work with him to do the work we that found he's the first doing. <laughs> and I can't find anybody to work on our thing, right? It's, this you can't find them either. <laughs> we really are in deep trouble. I'm not Last time I checked, that's true. <laughs> he's not even searching. Okay. <laughs> so, Max, where, where is the problem on the legal front? And this is now really kind of shifting the debate totally somewhere else. But um, I think, just to probably connect a bit to that, I, th I think a lot of these things we can uh, enforcing get done. We're very much at the beginning of, of that part. I'm just talking about my narrow little privacy thing, which is by far not the whole digital world I know. But um, I think, like, for example, how far we went there and it was extremely interesting, for example, after Cambridge Analytica, first of all, the European regulation was like the crazy old Europeans that want to kind of protect the old world as it was and it's never going to work. The week after Cambridge Analytica had like all the calls from, I don't know, BBC or the CNN or whatever, it's like, can you tell us about this innovative idea that you had to regulate the internet and how great it and is? And we passed it in <laughs> California three months later, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. So it's kind of interesting that there are these uh, possibilities. We still have a huge problem in Europe with, again, I'm getting back to the enforcement issue, and that is the solidarity issue among the European countries to a large extent. Because talking about mm -hmm. um, the, taxes. the taxes, for example, it wouldn't be said, I mean, it's absurd. I, I was like years ago when still Christian Kern was head of the Social Democrats, I was like in a TV studio and said, you know, I pay more taxes as a student back then than Starbucks does in Austria. Because Starbucks pays 1,600 euros at the time. Um, and that's so obviously, like, crazy and it's so easy to solve as the European Union, but obviously the Netherlands and I don't know, and, and, and Ireland and so on has issues in that direction. Long story short, we have to get our act together for like these enforcement issues, for example, but I think there's the possibility to get the law done. That's usually done by the European Union and structurally problem that we have is the EU passes laws, but it does not have the troops, so to say, on the ground to enforce it because that's up to the member states. And on taxing, it's all member states. But um, I think that is realistic to do. We're a market that's big enough to, to get that done, but I'm getting back to what you said before, is what we fundamentally need is visionary people that actually have good solutions to a lot of these issues. Because on the privacy stuff, like it's a very narrow old thing that we have lost since the 80s. It's not a very innovative space compared to many of these other issues. Um, and we're lacking political leadership in that. We lack people that have that knowledge. That's oftentimes in California, in the US, where we could oftentimes copy ideas from there, I think. Um, and what we're totally missing is, as you said before, parties that identify with that fully. Usually on the privacy side, it was mainly the Green Party, sometimes the Liberals. Yes. Um, but for example, it's a basically a social democratic issue of how we redistribute power in a society. And that is like the oldest like social democratic like core value. But they do nothing on digital stuff throughout the European Union for most um, places. I think that is where we, where we oftentimes lack really good innovative solutions. And I'm, I'm, less, I'm less pessimistic on getting them on the ground, though. Yes. Last word. <laughs> Last word about everything you wanted to tell us. Ah, finally. Um, well, I mean, look, I think the situation, uh, you know, 
serious but not hopeless. Uh, in that, I think we still have the ways of thinking, um, you know, going about things, in Europe at least, where we kind of naturally understand that if it touches upon the question of infrastructure, we don't want that infrastructure to be run by some private equity okay. firm and have the trains run the way they are run in Britain, right? So, I mean, I think there is some easy cognitive shortcut that we can take. The problem is that most of the debates about the digital economy, and, you know, they don't just happen in Silicon Valley that way. They also happen that way in Brussels. So, you know, if you go and start listening to how the commission and how the policymakers discuss about those, those, those matters, I mean, by design, they have to be objective and they have to always come up with this rather empty terms, you know, we would like to make the digital economy more sustainable. What does it mean, mm -hmm. right? So politicizing how we speak about these things, I think is not a bad start. That requires, of course, a very different public sphere. You know, it requires journalists, think tanks, organizations, universities to take this issue seriously but then to also try to connect it to very rich intellectual traditions that we have. You know, that, you know, we, I think we have a way to think about political economy. We have a way to think about capitalism globally. This is where, you know, I disagree quite a bit, for example, with Shoshana Zuboff and to some extent with Roger. I mean, I don't really think that a label like surveillance capitalism uh, is adequate to understand what's going on, in part because it overemphasizes this humanistic surveillance label and de-emphasizes all of the geopolitical and other factors that account for the power of those firms. Um, and this is where we have choices to make, and unfortunately, the traditional institutions, as I said, were thinking about such matters happen, um, no longer are up to the task. But Robert, uh, Roger has a suggestion which said, stop the clock for now until we can get any of the institutions. But, you know, this, is, like this is where you know, I really think we need to ground this in uh, how, such for, how this firms acquired such power to begin with. You know, and this is where my account is probably much more grounded in history than in some kind of analytical understanding of how these firms work at the microeconomic level. Right? For me, it's obvious that they came to fill in certain gaps. You know, Google comes, if you look at what these companies do in municipalities or when they work with, at the regional level and they come to, I don't know, the regional government of Umbria in Italy. You know, they come to a regional administrator who has found themselves under conditions of austerity for the last 10 years mm -hmm. since the financial crisis. Absolutely. They have no money. Then IBM or Google comes and says, oh, you know, we can introduce a fantastic service into your healthcare system that will help us diagnose people with cancer faster and at better rates. And if you are an honest, distant public servant and your choice is between letting Google in or actually letting people die, I mean, what do you choose? Right? And those, I would argue, are the majority of decisions. And then, you know, of course, there are darker ones with lobbyists, corruption, revolving doors, there is all of that as well. But a lot of those decisions, they are driven by economics and not by misunderstanding or corruption. And I think that unless we grapple with the structural conditions that made this possible and that made it so pronounced, we, are not, we will not be able to stop that clock because stopping the clock on many of those services, you know, it would mean disruption that governments, unfortunately, would not like to run. Those are not the kind of risks that anybody would like to take. And stopping the clock without having a vibrant, functioning, efficient alternative, I don't think it's ever going to fly. I mean, it might happen at the user level, so it might be easier to convince people to stop using it, I think it would be so much harder to convince the enterprise, but also the public sector public users sector, of those yes. services. Look at the smart city stuff. I mean, if you have a well-functioning city, like you do here in Vienna, uh, you know, with a lot of infrastructure, with money, with public uh, capacity, with bureaucracy to do things, perhaps you would not need Google. If you are a city that's deeply in debt, that does not have that infrastructural power, that you know is basically struggling and you have this fantastic service that they promise to install out of a box and it will work and will make your transportation more efficient. It's a very tempting proposition. But, right? but 
but Roger, Afghani, you now have there, the last word. But isn't there a we, fundamental problem with that issue? Because the promise of smart cities has been basically a complete misrepresentation of what they can really do. And so often we're buying into a lie. Sure. I mean, but, you know, we can talk about the packaging of the smart cities, but I can assure you that, you know, every single garbage can in a modern European city within the next five years will have a sensor in it and somebody will operate that sensor. And that somebody can be the local internal bureaucracy of a city, okay. which has the capacity to do it, or it can be Cisco, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, or somebody else, right? Whether we're going to call it the smart city or garbage city or something else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. not really that worried. Okay. Roger, I think we will be on time. I'll just give you the word to wrap it up. No, I just, you know, listen, I want us to all leave here tonight with the notion that optimism is really important. And it's, op it's really important on the issue you're talking about. We have to build representative democracy again in many countries in the West. I don't know where you are really here in Austria, but you got an election on Sunday. I hope everybody votes. And the thing I can tell you is in the United States, if we get 62% out in the United States, that'll be the highest number in almost 50 years. And, you know, that's insane. I just think that everybody getting engaged and everybody caring about these issues is the first step. And, you know, I'm not sure where it's going to lead. And I just hope that... Uh, you'll all join us in being part of this thing, because we all have a stake in it. And the future is only inevitable if we sit back and let it be. I'm not going to wrap up this discussion. I think we put a lot of issues on the table here. The one thing we haven't discussed in detail is the whole question of democracy and how it's being affected in an age of disinformation. But I think elections are around the corner here, day after tomorrow. Uh, so we will see uh, whether this is a, a universal phenomena or there is something slightly particular to the United States in, uh, this, on this question. I'd like to just thank all three of you for a really interesting discussion and thank you for being with us this evening.